that. So he decides this is important because we're going to address it, not to do what God is asking him to do in ministry. And sometimes Christians do that. They don't want to do what God calls them to do. They want to do what they want to do in the church. And you'll see what's going to happen when that mindset takes place. Um, because we'll talk about it later. One of the big things, though, that Jonah was supposed to do is share the gospel, to talk about Jesus. And it hasn't changed to 2024. That's really the church's goal, is to talk about Christ, let people know. And I'm wondering, those of you listening online, how and in person, how often do we do that? Really? I mean, it's, we're supposed to do that before we say, come to my church, <laughs> you, you know. Um, it's talk about, well, I don't know how to talk about him. I don't know how to witness. All you have to do is tell people what he's done for you. That's not hard. You ever see when people are in love? Tell them that. Don't talk about your boy or your girl. They keep doing it. Is there a set little pattern that they're supposed to? No, they just babble, babble, babble. Well, the Bible's a love letter to you about someone who loves you more than anybody could possibly love a human. So talk about him. It's a love story. Tell him what he's done, what he's doing. It's not that hard. Satan would prefer us to just play church on Sunday and keep our mouth shut on Monday. And that's what most Christians do. All right, Roman numeral three, the foolish attempt. This guy thought he could just deny God and get out of it. Um, maybe he hadn't been having his quiet times because the psalmist says, where can I go? Where can I go and be out of your presence? And the, the answer is obviously, you know, nowhere. And apparently, Jonah forgot it. So then that brings us to Roman numeral four. Uh, and we've titled it the divine manipulation of circumstances. Last week, we read through it just to see the dialogue and what was going on with, um, with the, the sailors that were on there. And they all were praying to their other god. Anyway, Jonah obviously admits, it's me. All this mess has come because I started it. I'm being disobedient. So they throw him overboard as an offering. We get rid of him, and then maybe the storm subsides, which it did. The other part of it is, though, God saves him. Otherwise, he would have drowned. God saves him through the whale. So isn't that interesting? They throw him over for the sacrifice. God still cares for him, makes sure that, you know what? He's not going to die. I'll save him. I'm going to have this whale take him. And then we're not done because we're going to go back to the original plan. I need you up at Nineveh where all these nutcases are living life crazy. And I need them to hear what I have to say. That sets us up. So you ready? All right. So let's take a look at, um, you think that would be an attention getter? <laughs> you get swallowed by a whale. You think that would get your attention a little bit? Like God, it fits on Sunday. Maybe I should use it as an intro. Jonah got an attention getter, a big one. And that's exactly what God wanted. I need to talk to you. And that's the very thing that he does with us to hear his voice. He'll do the attention getter. So there are four things. Did we mention this? Okay. There are four things that can happen to a Christian in relationship to God's will. Uh, so let me, let me add something, though. Uh, there, you can have God's perfect will, or, his, or sometimes people call it his directive will. That's not in the outline. I'm just giving it to you. So you have God's perfect will and his permissive will. 
It's easier to remember with the P's. Perfect will, permissive will. What's the perfect will? He speaks, you hear, you do. Okay? Perfect will. His directive will, you get it, you're obedient. His permissive will is he's telling you to do something, you decide not to do it. So because you are a free moral agent, you get to choose yes or no. And so what God does is allows that, and he gives you his permissive will then. So some people are called to ministry, and they, they never do it. They don't want to. And so then when that happens, God doesn't kill them. Okay, you have second best if you look at it from God's perspective. That God wanted you here, you decided not to do it. Okay, can you still have a good life? Sure you can. The best life? No. There'll be something missing. And I'm, now I'm speaking from experience. And I think I left off with the story about me, God calling me, did I, and I mentioned going, uh, not really wanting to do it, and I went to become a counselor. Did I mention that? Yeah. So all those doors kept shutting. And, and I mean, the biggest one to me was well, I looked at everybody in, at Northridge. They were, this was midlife career change people. I'm like 23 or 24. Now I'm looking at them, looking at me, and I go, this is a laydown. These people haven't been in school for 20 years. I got this one. And the arrogance and the pride was there. I, I was a believer, but I said, Psh, I got the program. I was the only one that didn't get accepted of a class of 25. So now, you think that was an attention getter? It was for me, because I was used to performing at a high standard. I don't get in, and then God moves me into present work. And here we go. Okay, now I'm getting fulfilled, and then we come up to committed people saying, if you think you're called to full-time Christian work, you better get trained. And I'm like, I don't want to go back to school. I don't need that. Okay, and so here I am in prison, and then I'm seeing a lot of stuff, thinking, man, I need to get trained but I don't want to be a pastor because I just felt like they were out of touch. And so watch what happens. I applied to seminary. And the seminary that I applied to, I got accepted. Another story to that at a later time. But they had three, uh, three, not roles, um, three, hmm? Not three courses, it was um, programs, I should say. They had the counseling program, the pastoral program, the biblical studies program, all three year masters. And I went, biblical studies. The guy looked at me and goes, if you're smart, you'll take the pastoral program. Why, I don't wanna be a pastor. And he goes, it's the harder program, but it's the better one. I said, well, I know I don't want to do the counseling thing because I started learning some more, which you guys will get the benefit online and in person of a place you can go to read about Freud and others. But another story, long story short, here's what happens. I take the pastoral program because it was the hardest and it was the best. Now, what do you think God is doing? That's right, setting me up for where he wants me to go. Had he told me, pastor, I wouldn't have done it. But instead, I'm thinking, prison for life. These are my guys, and I'll be the best there. And look what ends up happening after eight years doing that. God moves, and voila, guess what? My degree is in the very thing that I'm doing. So just because the door shut, they did with Jonah, they did with me, God doesn't quit. 
with us. He's still saying, come on, let's get with this. And then you learn through the process. I learned a lot. But I was basically just like Jonah. And the doors kept shutting. And that was getting my attention. Why? All right. Maybe you're having some doors shut. And you're thinking it's a trial. It may be God's directing you. It's a possibility. Something that you should take a look at. Perfect will, permissive will. If you're filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, we're going to talk about it Sunday, you will be getting God's perfect will. If you aren't walking in the Spirit, then you're doing His permissive will. Those are the only two options a Christian has. Another way to say permissive will, that's just a nice way of saying you're living fleshly. That you're, you're, you're a first Corinthian if you will. You're living in the flesh. You're still saved, but the relationship with God is mechanical, probably. Uh, so those are two important things to, to look at. Now, four things can happen. Let's look at A. Here's the first one. You can accept God's will without resistance, okay, and, or questioning, and reap the benefits, okay? So that's your first option, that's the best one. Accept, you know, his will, and don't question it. Trust him in it, because he's smarter than you, he knows what's right, he's got a plan, it's planned out, and he knows you'll be fulfilled in doing it. Um, and, and that is so true, if you, if you know God's will, there's nothing else that will satisfy you. I knew that once God was calling me and I made the commitment, I knew that, that I couldn't do anything else in life that would make me happy. All the, the, the money and all that, it, inside, I wouldn't be at peace. And, um, and so that's the first and the best one. Um, but let me ask you a question on this. Is it necessary to understand everything? What do you think? I mean, I, I talked about it last Sunday. Pros and cons on the church that I ended up taking. All but one were cons. Negative, negative, negative. Now I'm looking at the paper. In the natural, in my flesh, it says don't take it. It's a bad place. Okay? In the spirit realm, where God is ministering to me, I have a peace about it. Fortunately, I made the right choice and took it. But do I need to know everything that how it's going to play out and what is going to happen? No. All I need to know is that this is what God wants. And um, I don't have to have X. We tend to do that. You know, when you look at Job, for example, one of the best chapters, that's the oldest book in the Bible. One of the best things he says is there is that I know in my flesh, he's thinking he's dying. I know in my flesh I will see God again face to face. What a statement. But in, in, in chapter 42 he goes, you know what? Because the whole book, we preached through it. It was an amazing book. The whole book, it's question after question after question. And then what's really funny, part of the book, God has his sense of humor. He goes... Because Job's asking, why? How, why is this happening? shouldn't be happening. My friends are accusing me of having sin. I got no sin in my life. Why are you allowing all this stuff? And then finally God goes, well, I got a question for you. Where were you when I created the galaxies? And then he goes, where were you when I made the seas? Oh, that's right, Job. You weren't even born yet. And then he starts to ask these types of questions. And in chapter 42, you know what Job tells him? You know what? I don't need any answers. You're God. I'll just trust you. Let's walk. There it is. And the thing that Job, the attention getter for him, because the Bible said there wasn't a, a more righteous man in all the earth at that time. So the attention getter is that Job 
struggled with pride. And this is why he was, those questions he was asking God, and God said, you don't need to know. Just trust me. Is there something in your life where you've got the why and you're not getting an answer? Maybe you should just trust God and go, you know what, God? If you want to share it with me later, share it. If you don't and I go to be with you never knowing, I'll, you can tell me then. It's good. Let's walk. That's what he wants from you and I. That shows ultimate trust in a walk. All right. Um, any, I think I had one more question. Um, oh, yes. Um, was God manipulating Job or uh, Jonah to do what he wanted to do, do you think, since God has sees the circumstances, provided the whale in order that Joe, or I keep wanting to say Joe, man, that Jonah um, wouldn't die. Um, so do you think God manipulated Jonah? Okay, no. Can you give me a re... Okay, so for those of you online, everybody here said no. That's not God's personal makeup, right? What one thing, when he created us, would give us that answer? Free will. There it is. Free will. That God created man to have a free will, to choose. He has that ability. Animals do not. They react on instinct. Apes do not analyze, okay? They react, every animal is instinctive in their behavior. Only humans can sit back, analyze, and then decide. That's a big, big point. So God still gave Jonah the opportunity. Now he had the fish and he set it up, but Jonah still had to come to a conclusion and, make, and repent and make the decision. It's still an individual choice. It's, that's important to see because we live in a culture today that says, well, I'll give you an example uh, dealing with prison. You know, I came from a broken home. I don't know my dad. We live in poverty. I, I live in Watts and didn't have the opportunity to go to a decent high school, didn't have the opportunity to go to a decent college. And hey, it's rough out here and it's not like Ventura. And so I'm not privileged. That's the talk today. No, you commit the crime, dog, because you made a choice. And it has nothing to do with where you grew up. Some people live in Watts and don't go to prison. Others live in Watts and do. And it all hinges on a decision of the will. And nobody forced them to do it. Now it's so inundated in our culture that now we're blaming our parents for things because we're not successful. And that's just wrong. That's just wrong. Uh, it, you keep watching it because it's there. Um, by the way, oh, I want to say this so bad. Um, let me say it. The Harvard president that came out and has since resigned, okay? And every, but they kept her, and she still makes 900000 a year teaching her class. That's fine. Here's why I'm going to use. Guess whose dissertation she plagiarized? It's the lady I'm going to share for Black History Month. And that lady was far from privileged. She raised four kids without a husband. She never went to a private school, all public. She lived in the hood. 
got her PhD, is a professor. And when I saw her book, I went, oh my goodness, why aren't people talking about this woman? She's in her 60s now. And then when I saw the thing at Harvard, I went, she made the, I have to give the Harvard president props. She picked a good person to read. Now we're going to give the name next month, and I'll bring the book. And I would encourage you to check it out. So I don't buy the, I had it rough stuff. Actually, if you had it rough, you're probably better. You're stronger. You're not weak. Because things were harder for you to to, to overcome. You didn't have the silver spoon. That's just a hobby horse for me. But you can't blame it. Choice, free will knocks that baby out. And so, if you and I have free will, then we have choice. And we do have it. All right. Letter B. Resist it and compel God to make emergency measures. Wow. Let me give you two scriptures. We don't have any under here, but I'm going to give you two. Um, Exodus 23, 28 is one. Exodus 23, 28. And let me read this. Uh, God's angel is to prepare a way, and we're reading law, justice, the laws of justice and mercy. And then we get to verse 28. And God says this, I, this is God speaking, I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites out of your way. Mm. So now an example of God taking emergency measures when he needs to. The other one is... Um, I think it's Joshua. I think that's it. Oh, I should have tagged it. Uh, Joshua, write this down. And I have to find it. It's Joshua 24. Um, Joshua 24, verse, verse 12, I think. I think that's it. Joshua 24, verse 12. Let's see if that's, if I'm right. 191. Yes. It's correct. Joshua 24, verse 12. Here's what it states. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you. Also the two Amorite kings, you did not do it with your own sword and bow. So again, you see God intervening. Um, and in Jonah's situation, what did he do? He ended up causing the storm, having the whale to handle what he wanted at a later time. He was compelling, if you will. I, I, I should say... He didn't compel them to go against their will, but he made them made Jonah make a choice. He put him in a condition because right now he didn't want to make a choice. You know how you have a lot of people that just don't want to confront people? You ever seen that? Sometimes you're in the business world and they're just not very confrontive, so they let it go. And so that's sort of like what Jonah was at. He didn't want to confront this thing. He didn't want to do it, so he figures I'll go... And, and get out of here. Um, so now God brings harder circumstances for him. Would have been a lot easier if he'd just been obedient. Now he's got to go through being in a whale, thought he was going to die, you know, and going through that whole process uh, that God took him through. Um, all right, letter, let's go to um, letter C. Reject the will that God wants for you and become a discard. That's the potential. What does that mean? Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 9.27. 1 
1 Corinthians 9.27. not saying this happens all the time, but it's a possibility that I've seen it happen in, in ministry, and it's a possibility that it can happen if, if um, this is God's will. 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, and here's what it states. I'm, I'm sure you've probably read this numerous times. Um, here's Paul. No, I beat my body and make, and make it my slave. So that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. The key word is disqualified. What can happen when you're disobedient? And Paul says, nah, I'm not, I'm gonna, I got to take some heat. And this is a guy that took a lot of it. Everywhere he went, it was an issue. From Christians, from Jews, from secular people, it was a battle his whole life. But what he's saying here is I'm forcing my body to do God's will, to be a slave to me, in other words. And, and I don't want to be disqualified. And I've seen ministers where they hedge, don't do it. And you know what ends up happening? God puts them on a shelf. They just have no more ministry. None. And that's the... the the risk that we take if God is leading us, calling us to do something. He may just put you in, out of operation in that area. And there's something different when God has called the person and they're obedient. It's the perfect will and they're fulfilling it. You see it in church. You see it in preaching. You may not be able to articulate it. But you know there's something different. You know, something different. And that's usually that, that walk that the person has. It doesn't have to be preachers. It can be just church people. There's something different. And um, we don't want to be in a situation where God is calling us to serve. And I'm not saying you got to be leaving Ventura. I'm just saying for his will in your life, serving wherever he calls you. It doesn't even have to be in a church. It can just be helping others. Um, you should do it. Because after a while, you may say, okay, I'll move on to somebody else who's going to do it. And we definitely, we, we definitely don't want that. Um, and, and the thing that's interesting about this, I ask a couple of, a couple of questions, too, I have for you, is that, no matter what your abilities or position that you have, doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. If you're out of the will of God, th what we just read is always a, a situation that's possible. You know, people think that because they have big secular positions, that that automatically <laughs> uh, qualifies them to have big church positions. <laughs> You know, if you're a lawyer and you come to Olivet, then right away you should be a board member because you got the education. Not if the pastor knows what he's doing. Because it, church doesn't run with a secular mind. It runs with a spirit-filled mind. And so uh, some of my best deacons, best deacons in L.A., and we had the police chief of Long Beach. We had a city council person. We also had Crips coming too, former Crips. But my best deacon was a construction worker. Okay? And he didn't have any education. Uh, but his walk was tight. And do you know the funny thing about it? When I came there, Everybody told me, now this guy, he prays too long. And I'm like, what? And they said, he prays too long. Now, I don't know anybody. So I'm just sitting back watching everything. And so we had the prayer time at church, the altar prayer. 
okay? Only I let the deacons do it. And my guy gets up, and he's praying. <laughs> it was a little long. It was long. Um, but I liked it. You know, I mean, it wasn't that it could be a little long. I get it. But, man, it, it was heartfelt, you know. And um, I said, man, let him go. We don't have people like this here, you know. Hey, you, you all have one here. You, you got a guy coming that comes in here every Sunday. You don't see it happen, but I do. And I sit back and go, man, this is something. And he's not even a member. He shows up every Sunday. You know what he does? I'm, I'm going to say something now because he's not here. He walks in those doors, and the first thing he does puts both of his hands up like this. And he walks and sits down. And I, I saw him the other Sunday, and I went, look at that. I like it, you know. And it's not a mechanical thing. It's a love relationship. And, you know, so um, it doesn't matter what station in life you are in. That stuff doesn't matter to God. It, it matters where your heart's at. And for, for Jonah, he had a little bit of a problem that needed to be corrected. Do you think we can relate to, to Jonah? Yeah. God has set, had in us to do something. We don't do it. And, you know, and because we have a free will, and we may not even think twice about it, and it comes up again. We don't do it. Yeah, and then the Holy Spirit talks to us, and then we got to ask for forgiveness. Well, we get to letter D, and here's what, here's what happens. Um, and let me ask you a question before we read it. It says, believe, well, let me read it. Believe that in the will of God, all things will work together for good. Okay, let me ask you a question. Is God's will always pleasant? It isn't, right? It's his will for you and I to do certain, whatever it is he's telling you, but it's not always pleasant. You, you know, uh, the first church I had, are you kidding? I was honest when I said I went to hell and back. If I told you the stuff that, that I went through, which I probably will, you'll get parts of them in sermons. It was fun later, but I had house cleaning to do, and that wasn't fun. All the horror stories you hear about stuff in church, they came my way. And so, and then I go back to God and go, what are you doing? See, the same issue, you know, I'm obedient, and I'm getting hammered here. I want out. See? And, and, and so uh, it's not always pleasant, but it's perfect. At the end of the day, if that's what God's calling you to do, you'll see it work for your good. I don't care what it is. It'll be right, even if it's bad at the time. Don't, never forget that. That if that's God's will and he's got you somewhere and you don't like it, it'll work out. He has you there for again, attention getter. And what was God working on with me? Well, I can tell you one thing. I just came out of a successful prison situation. Do you know what I said when I took that church? Because I told him one year and I'm out and I get to do my thing. Find a black preacher, you got him, and I'm out. So I was very prideful, very arrogant. Right, here's what I said. This church is not all of it. Their church lived in there. And I said, oh, you know what? This church is shut down. All right, one year, it'll be packed. Now, that's arrogance. It'll be packed because I'm so good. That's basically what I was saying. I had a Bible study with 500. This is nothing. I got in inmates don't like you. They just get up and why everything is. So no problem. You'll be packed. Well, a year went by. We went from four. <laughs> we went from four to about eight. 
Now, that was a big attention getter for me. See, now I'm getting notched down a level, like I'm, I'm missing it. It's not me, it's not the education. It's submitting to God and having humility and let him be the show. Now, one day, did it get full? Oh, yeah, a couple of services. But it took a while, a long while. But it happened. So I learned a lot through it in my personal walk. So whatever you're going through, boy, God's working. You get an attention getter. He wants to share something with you. Then you need to be asking, what is it I need to learn, God? What do I need to do? And he'll tell you. Uh, all right. Um, well, let me ask one other thing. Dang it. You think Romans 8.28 is true? If you don't have it, it's not in your out. Well, is it? Yeah, it is. So let me read it. That's one of the scriptures, Romans 8.28. That's a great verse if you ever get discouraged. Oh, my goodness. What a verse to, um, to remember. And it's so good because every time the enemy says, look at this, look at you, look at the situation. Here's what Paul says. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Or the King James Version says, all things work together for good for those that are called by God um, and, and love him. So that means that little word all includes bad things all things that little word brings it all everything God will take and work together for good for you if you're called and you love him you're a believer and you love him he's gonna do it God can't lie it's a promise see so please remember that Believe the will of God, and all things will work together for good. Let's take another scripture here. Um, and then I'll, we'll close with one question that you can muse over for a week until next Wednesday. Uh, Philippians 4.11. As we'll be back in that book soon as well. F Philippians 4.11. He's saying, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. Paul experienced it. He's saying whether I live big, live low, whatever it is, makes no difference. And he was on both sides of it. You know, he's saying that I have learned to be content in whatever my circumstance. What a statement, because most of us, we're, we're not. We live by our circumstance. Circumstances should make no difference in terms of us being content, being happy, but they do if we have our heart on the wrong stuff. Um, you want one more? Let's do 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. I'm skipping the Hebrews one. 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. Still have a few minutes. 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, and it states, But godliness with contentment is great gain. There it is. Godliness, living right as best we can. We're not perfect. I got it. But it's great gain with being content. I used to ask God, why, why is it that you don't just give me a high rolling church sometime? that everything is there, and then we'll just take it to the next level. Why, why do I never get that? And one day, and it wasn't, it was, you know, maybe a few years back, God said, well, because not everybody can go in a mess and be able to stay in it and let me work. So, you have that personality, and you're not going to run. So that's the type of person I need. What difference does it make to you, whether you have 10 people 
or 10,000. And I went, you know what? You're right. What difference does it make to me? And you still take care of me. So, um, again, Romans 8.28 should be your, one of your theme verses. All things will work together for good, no matter what your circumstances are now. Jonah could have had that with the right attitude. Now, I'm going to leave you with this question. Since that is true in Romans 8.28, and you all nodded, this is for you to think about for next week, and we'll pick it up in the new outline, but we'll, we'll start with this. Why is it then we are so reluctant to be content with God's will? If Romans 8.28 is true, and we really believe it, why are we so reluctant to be content with God's will? That's an interesting question. One that I think myself and all of us should reflect on. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for the challenge. Jonah is not by himself. We, too, have decided at times to de make a decision and not do what you're calling us to do. And as we see what's happened to Jonah, you don't quit on us. You continue to give options to make us reflect and make a choice on doing the right decision. Each option gets more difficult, though, if we don't say yes. I just pray for everyone here and online that if there's something in your life that God is calling you to do, but you don't want to do it. Remember Romans 8.28. Remember that God still supplied Jonah with a way out, even after his disobedience. And the results were phenomenal once he committed to God's perfect will for him. Holy Spirit, thank you for the challenge. Thank you for being the mighty counselor. Thank you for showing us some basic things in our day-to-day -day walk that we all do. Uh, forgive us for not being as sensitive. Help us be more in tune to the attention getters so that we can hear from God himself speak directly to us. Give these that are in person traveling mercies home. Give those that are online that have taken the time to stop everything and focus on you. Give them both blessings. Reunite us Sunday that we can assemble and listen to the things that will allow us to hear the very voice of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. God bless you all. The thought, why are we so reluctant to accept God's perfect will for us?